as we're still in the first part of January, this is a time of year when a lot of us sit down to make a list of New Year's resolutions. Maybe you don't call them that, but things we want to be different this year, things we'd like to focus on, different priorities. This is a favorite time to set goals and objectives and, and emphases what we want to really concentrate on for the year ahead. And it's a reminder that as believers in Christ, spiritual growth and transformation in our lives don't just happen. These things have to be pursued. We have to be intentional about our relationship with the Lord because if we just let things go and we just live each day without being mindful of choices we're making or uh, priorities we're establishing, then we're going to look back at the end of a day or a week or a month or a year or a lifetime and be filled with regrets. Jonathan Edwards was a brilliant theologian. He was one of the leaders of the first great awakening in the 18th century. And he understood the importance of being purposeful in his spiritual life. As a young man, before the age of 20, he recorded in his journal 70 personal resolutions related to his soul and spiritual matters. And so I want to say, as you listen, I want to share some of these. And as you listen to them, you may think, oh, this was a, you know, a, a wise old granddad who wrote these things. No, this was a teenager. And I'm looking around the audience here. We have some younger women. And I want to say, uh, don't wait till you're old to make these kinds of choices or to have this kind of thinking. A friend of mine told me that a, a teenage young man he's been mentoring told him the other day, I want to wait till I'm older to get serious about God. I want to have fun now, and then when I'm older, I'll get serious about God. And scripture says, no, fear God now while you're young. And then I see all the older women nodding and thinking they wish they had been more intentional when they were younger. And all of us feel some of that. But here are some of, uh, resolution, some of the resolutions that Jonathan Edwards wrote out. He was throughout all of this dedicating himself to God giving up himself, his rights, all that he had to God. And so he purposed to live a purposeful life, an intentional life, not just existing. And he said, resolved never to do any manner of thing, whether in soul or body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God. Resolved to live for the glory of God. There's a teenager saying, I want everything I do to be for the purpose of bringing glory to God. And then he said, resolve never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. He said, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. So he wanted to live a purposeful, intentional life. And then he wanted to live a growing life, not spiritually stagnant, but growing. Here are a couple examples of that. He said, resolved to study the scripture so steadily, constantly, and frequently as that I may find myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. I want to get to know God's word. I want to grow spiritually. He said, resolved to strive every week to be brought higher spiritually and to a higher exercise of grace than I was the week before. I want to keep pressing on for higher ground, he said. And then he resolved to live an examined life, to be accountable to take stock regularly of where he was in his walk with the Lord and his spiritual disciplines. And as part of that, he said he wanted to read over these resolutions, 70 of them, once a week. Here is um, an example of wanting to live that kind of accountable life. He said, resolved to inquire every night as I'm going to bed, wherein I have been negligent, what sin I have committed, and wherein I have denied myself, also at the end of every week, month, and year. So I'm going to stop and think. I'm not just going to live life thoughtlessly. I'm going to stop, take stock, say, where am I in my walk with the Lord? He resolved to live a holy life. He said, resolved in narrations, that is in telling stories, never to speak anything but the pure and simple truth. So he wanted his speech to be holy and true. He was committed to live a life of victory over sin, to wage war against the natural bent of his sinful flesh. So he said, resolved, whenever I do any sinful action, to trace it back till I come to the original cause, and then both carefully endeavor to do so no more, and to fight and pray with all my might against the original of it. 
Now, some of this language is quaint, and you have to read these a little carefully. We have available in our resource center a copy of, a, uh, of these resolutions with some commentary I've written on them, and that's available through Revive Our Hearts. But he said, I'm, I'm not just going to let sin overtake me. I'm going to be intentional and persistent in waging battle against sin. And then he was committed to live a disciplined life, to live temperately for every aspect of his life to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. So here are a couple examples of that. He said, resolved to maintain the strictest temperance in eating and drinking. So his physical habits. He said, I want them to be temperate, not for its own sake, but again, for the glory of God, so I can be the most effective possible servant of the Lord. And then he talked about controlling his reactions and his emotions. He said, resolved when I am most conscious of provocations to ill nature and anger, that I will strive most to feel and act good naturedly. If I could put that in modern English, I'd say, resolved when my kids push my buttons, that I'm not going to react. I'm not going to hyperventilate. I'm going to act and feel and respond to them in a peaceable way. So that's part of disciplining and controlling our reactions and emotions. Well, I'll come back to some more of those in a few moments here. But here on Revive Our Hearts last week, you heard me talking with John Geiger, who has written a book where he interviewed a couple of dozen Christian leaders, including Kay Arthur, Michael Card, Gary Chapman, Tony Evans, Ravi Zacharias, Johnny Erickson Tata, and others. And somehow I was included in this uh, set of interviews. And he asked, he asked us to think about several questions. First of all, if you could have a do-over, what would you do more of and what would you do less of? And then he asked us to speak about regrets and how to deal with regrets. Because you get to later in life and you realized, I didn't do these things that I wished I'd done more of, or I did do too much of these things that I wish I had done less of. So what do you do about regrets? And then he asked us for our thoughts about eternity. What do you want on your tombstone? What is it you're anticipating about heaven? Well, over the last few days last week, we shared with you some of the answers that people gave to those questions, some names that you recognize, and I'm trusting that was an encouraging series of broadcasts for you. But I promise that this week, today and tomorrow, I would share with you some of my responses to those questions. And if I were to answer those questions a year ago, my answers might be different than they are today. So this is just a little slice of my life. This is not anything hugely inspired, but I wanted to share with you some of what I've been thinking about. As some of you have shared with us, if you could have a do-over, what would you do differently? But let me start with another question that John asked at the beginning of this interview. He said, why does it seem like every generation has to make the same mistakes? Why can't we leverage the wisdom of the saints from past centuries and somehow do better in our own Christian walk. So we don't have to be asking if I could do it all over again. And as I thought about that question from John, I realized there's so much that we can learn from those who've walked before us. My husband and I have attended a number of funerals together. And at our age, we're going to be attending more funerals. And that's a place, a good place to stop and think about the mark that a life leaves and what is said at the end of a person's life and uh, what the takeaways are. And so at some of these funerals, I've heard some precious testimonies about the impact of the lives of these people. And I've, as I've heard those stories, I thought, this is what it looks like to serve and love the Lord and others well. I've had some takeaways. These are things I would like to, my life to look like as I've thought about the lives of these people who've gone on. I also love reading biographies, uh, off, sometimes of people who are still living, but most often of those old dead guys and gals. Uh, I love reading. I'm a voracious reader of biographies. I'm almost always reading a biography. And if there's one genre of literature outside of the scripture that I heartily recommend, it would be biographies. And if you go to reviveourhearts.com, we've posted a list of some of my favorite biographies. I'm sure you have others you can add to that, but some of the ones that have made an impact on me since I was a little girl. I remember the first biography I ever read as a little girl was the biography of J.C. Penney. Why? I don't know, but I got my hands on that thing, and he was a believer, and it was a child's version of this, and I read it over and over and over again. I was just struck with the story of this man's life. I've read many others over the years, but 
to read about the example of these people, especially those who've really walked with God faithfully, and their courage, and their successes, and their failures, and their humility, and their honesty about their failures, and how they faced adversity, and all of these things, their values, their priorities, their regrets, their writings, these things have caused me to ponder my own life, my priorities, my choices. And, of course, I love reading the biographies of those found in the Scripture. The men and women of Scripture, you read about a lot of them in Hebrews chapter 11, these who've made that great hall of faith. And some of them, you say, how did they get included in that list? Because they sure did some dumb things. Well, I sure have done some dumb things. Maybe you have too. And yet to think that God would include those who made such significant errors, those who wavered in their faith, and yet they're included in this chapter on faith because they kept pressing on toward Christ, who is the end at the finish line of their faith. And so after giving us all that great challenge to consider these lives and then to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that's Hebrews 11 and 12, then we get to Hebrews 13, and the scripture says, remember your leaders. Or as one translation says, consider those who have taught you, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. But then the passage goes on to say, don't, don't, Put your eyes on those people as your ultimate model or example. Remember Christ. He is the one who inspired their lives, who enabled them to live that life. So remember Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 7 and 8. Because it's by fixing our eyes on Christ that ultimately we become who Christ made us to be. Now, as I go to the theme of this book, the major theme, if I could do it all over again, what would I do less of and what would I do more of? And um, that's a question I responded to for John. I'm going to share some of my list with you. But let me just give you two quick thoughts before sharing that list with you. The first is we can't do it all over again. So in a sense, you say, why would we ask that question? Because it's impossible to go back. There are no retakes. There are no redos of the past. We don't have any guarantees that we'll have tomorrow. We only have today. So today is the day where we need to live. And yet when we come back to this tomorrow, I want to talk to you some about living with regrets about the past. So on the one hand, we can't do it all over again. And yet here's something else to think about. It's not too late to start doing less of some things and more of others. We sat in this room a few moments ago and many of you shared, what would you do less of? What would you do more of? And as we were listening, I think all of our hearts were challenged to say, wow, that's something I need to think about now. It's not too late to start doing less of or more of the things that will make a difference in the sum total of our lives. So start today. And in light of the past, maybe today can be lived a little bit differently. So now, as I've been thinking about, if I could do it all over again, what would I do less of? What would I do more of? Here are some things that would be on my list in no particular order, okay? Number one is I would do less whining and complaining, and I would want to be more thankful and content. Thankful in everything. Content with what God provides. Realizing that what God has given me is all I need for my present peace and happiness, as someone has said. So I would hope I would be less inclined to whine and complain and more inclined to be thankful and content. So how about today? How about today? And then I would want to be less task-oriented and more people-oriented. Now, some of you are highly relational. You're very people-oriented, and tasks mean nothing to you. I had a brother who was that way. He's now with the Lord. He was a lover of people. And it's as if maybe he had some sense, which I don't think he did, that he wasn't going to have a long life. He was killed in a car wreck at age 22 when he was a junior at Liberty University. And he was one of these kids who tasks meant nothing to him, but people meant a lot to him. So he would forget to study for tests. He would forget he had tests. He would forget to go to class. He would forget to do papers. But he loved people. 
Now, I'm not recommending, for those of you who are students, I'm not really recommending that you skip tests and classes, but I am saying David lived a life. I still meet people who say, I was David's roommate, or I lived on his hall, or I knew him. He was so generous. He was so kind. He was a lover. David loved people. I'd like to be more that way. I tend to be more task-oriented. Get my stuff done. I got my list at the beginning of the day, and lists of my list, A, B, C, D, D, you know, and I want to just check things off my list. But I'll tell you now, especially, and even more as a married woman, I want to be more of a lover than a completer of my to-do list. And I think Robert is probably thankful I'm saying that, though he hasn't complained. Uh, I knew a man for many years, he's now with the Lord, who in his late 90s was asked what he would do differently if he could live his life over again. And this is what he had to say. He said, I would start every day by reading 1 Corinthians 13, and then I would root my life in love. Now, this man was a preacher over decades. He was greatly used of God, but he said, if I have a regret, it's that I've done so much for God that wasn't rooted in love. And I think about that as I think about being task-oriented versus people-oriented. Things and stuff versus souls and people and relationships and lives. And I think the difference there is this whole thing of love. Now, I heard this from a man in his late 90s, so what am I going to do about this? Now, I'm in my late 50s. I don't want to get to my late 90s and say, I wish that I had rooted my life more in love. I want to think about that now. Here's another thing on my list. I would like to have been less focused on self, less concerned about how others view me and what they think about me, and more focused on others, on their needs, their concerns. We all know people, it's easier to see it in others than in ourselves, right? Who, when you walk in the room, you have a conversation. It's all about them. I've seen this with Christian leaders, I, some. I've seen it with friends. I've seen it with family members. I've seen it, you know, just it's all about me. And then I think, how often do I have conversations with staff, with friends, with my husband, with our ministry partners, and it's all about me. And I would like to be the kind of person, we've known some of these, who when you walk in the room and they're there, it's all about you. And they're asking, how are you? How, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? Now, that doesn't mean we never share what's going on in our lives, but I'd like to be more other-centered and less obsessed with what others are thinking about me or others knowing how I'm doing. I'd like to be more concerned in knowing how they're doing. I'd like to focus, as I look back on my life, less on wanting others to serve me and make me happy and make my life easier, and I'd want to focus more on wanting to serve and bless and make others happy. Again, we don't want to be a slave to making others happy. You can't make everyone happy. We've all learned that. But I'd like to have that focus adjusted a bit in my life. I'd like to be less critical of others, less impatient with their weaknesses and their failures, which is a natural thing for all of us to do, but it's toxic to assume the worst of others rather than the best of others. I'd like to be less focused on the issues and problems in their lives. And instead, more, here's this love thing again, more loving, more gracious, more kind, quicker to assume the best of others and to try and build them up in their strong areas, to encourage them and to bless them. You know, by the way, this critical spirit, which I think runs naturally in the human race, I think it runs naturally in women, and I think it runs in my family. I'll just say that. And I'm in my family. And we've been exposed to a lot, seen a lot, heard a lot, and it's easy to just evaluate everyone who comes into our path as in a way that is picking out the faults rather than looking for the things to celebrate. And that is toxic. I don't like it when others are that way. What makes me think that others would want to be around me when I'm that way? And this is another good thing of marriage, by the way, is having someone to reflect you to yourself. And sometimes my husband will say, knowing that I am an editor and that an editor gets paid to look for mistakes, he would, he, occasionally he'll say, are you being my editor? Now, he doesn't say it unkindly, but I know what he means is in that moment, I'm not blessing him with encouragement. 
Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a time to say, here's something we need to talk about, and we have those conversations, and Robert is a humble man who is so willing to have those conversations. But anybody gets worn out if the first thing that comes out of our mouths is that which is negative or critical. I'd like to have less wasted time, fewer trivial pursuits, less mindless entertainment, less social media, less connected to my smartphone, which has made me dumb. I'm just saying. It doesn't make me dumb. I've made myself dumb by spending too much time on my smartphone. And in their place, place of those things, I like to spend more time in prayer, more time in reading and meditating on Scripture, soaking in God's Word, more time making my moments and my days count, being intentional with them. I like to spend less frittering away of my early morning and late evening hours and use those hours in a more purposeful way. I like to start and end every day meditating on Jesus, having him fill my thoughts before anything else does. Uh, My husband's in the room, so I'm going to say this knowing that I'm really accountable, and he's maybe not going to believe it when I say this because he's a really early-to-bed, early-to-rise man, which I do believe is a really wise way to live. That's the way my daddy was, and but I've not been that way for a long, long time. So I'm just saying here, honey, I would like to get to bed earlier and get up earlier. Now, I don't know if I want to get up the same time you get up because that's really, really, I, that's not morning, that's kind of night, but... I look back over my life, and um, I'd like, here's the reason. I want to be able to do a better job of giving those early morning hours while I'm fresh to the Lord. In fact, Dr. W.A. Criswell, who was the venerable pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas for decades, I asked him when I was about 18 years old what counsel he would have for me as a young woman moving toward a, a vocational ministry life. And without hesitating, he said, give your mornings to God. Give your mornings to God. My dad was a man who gave his mornings to God. Now, not all of every morning, but he was up first thing in the morning, as my precious husband is at before the crack of dawn, um, to seek the Lord, to be in the word, on his knees. And um, so much time we waste at night, on the internet, on TV, games, even conversations that are not bad necessarily, but sometimes just trivial. And we'll talk tomorrow about the fact that that doesn't mean everything has to be heavy duty, intentional purpose, but there has to be some sense of this is something that matters and that I will be able to give account for at the end of my life. I'd like to talk less to others and talk more to God. And then something I've been thinking about more as I'm getting older, and that has to do with my physical habits, which was never really important to me as a young woman. But now I'm in my late 50s, thinking more about these things and wishing that I had been less sedentary, less physically indulgent. I'd like to eat less and get more physical exercise. Not to be a model figure. That really is not something that I aspire to. But to have the strength, the energy, and the mental, social, emotional well-being to be the kind of person we're talking about here. And as I've gotten older, I've seen increasingly how our body, soul, and spirit are so tied together. And the effects that our physical habits can have on our emotional and spiritual well-being and how these things are so tied together. Okay, I've not been a great example of this through my life, but today is a new day and there is new grace. And what would that look like for me today? And then let me just give you this last one, and we'll pick up this conversation tomorrow. I'd like to be less discouraged, less downcast, and less prone to having my moods be dependent on my circumstances. And in the place of that, I would love to have been a more joyful, hopeful woman who keeps her eyes and her heart fixed on Jesus. Now, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by all of this and just thinking about all these things. I can feel overwhelmed because I'm going, what am I going to I want to just go home and take a nap having thought about all this stuff. I want to go home and eat just thinking about all of this. So don't let this overwhelm you because we walk and live in grace and in hope. But maybe there's one thing that's been said or just the thought of being a little more intentional 
about how you use your days, how I use my days, and what kind of person do we want to be at the end of our lives, and then what steps could we take, what baby steps could we take today to have that be more true by the time we get there. My dad always used to tell us, you are what you have been becoming. It's true, isn't it? But we are becoming today what we will be at the end of our journey. So Lord, I pray that you'd give us wisdom, help us to order our hearts and our affections aright, and to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Thank you that you see us through eyes of grace and acceptance. This is not about getting your favor. but This is about having a more intimate love relationship with you and a more fruitful life. And that's what we want. So show us what that means for each of us in this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.